So, faced with the question, where did they go next with this podcast? The guys were recently joined by legendary musical genius Bruce Dickerson, who's agreed to be the new producer of the Stack and Benjamin show. They were all excited to meet him. Hey, fellas, I'm Bruce Dickerson. Yes, the Bruce Dickerson. You have a dynamite sound, fantastic sound. I have only one suggestion. More cowbell. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and happy Mother's Day weekend. We're all excited up in here because, hey, if it weren't for Joe's mom, we wouldn't even have a show now, would we? Well, at least that's what she keeps telling us. Hey, today, we're going to talk about something every mom warns their children about not doing too often. Debt. Here to help us, we welcome from NAV, credit expert Jerry Detweiler. Plus, from this podcast, OG. And from LenPenzo.com, we're going to welcome Len Penzo's mom. (laughs) Actually, to be a helpful son, Len told his mom he'd go ahead and do this appearance on his own. It's just Len Penzo. But hey, happy Mother's Day, Len's mom. Plus, in our Friday FinTech segment, have you ever wondered about buying farmland as an investment? (laughs) Who hasn't? These guys did, and we'll introduce you to them, because Carter Malloy from AcreTrader will join us. And now, the guy who just took pictures of Mother's Day cards at Target to share with his mom, it's Joe Salcihai. Isn't that the frugal hack? Instead of spending $49 on a Mother's Day card, just take pictures of the funny ones. Show her those, and then everybody wins, and there's less trash. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Stacky Benjamins. I am Joe Salcija. I average Joe Money on Twitter. And man, do we have a fun group with us today. Actually doing his own appearance from deep under Los Angeles, it's Mr. Len Penzo. Glad that you decided to do this one yourself. Well, you know, I had to fight my mom off when she found out uh, that she had an opportunity for, there for a brief moment. Uh, it was like Katie bar the door. Good thing my bunker has multiple locks on it. You know, we'd rather have her. That would be way better. <laughs> hey, maybe we'll work that out. That, hey, you know, I'm really interested in this uh, farmland uh, discussion you're going to have. The middle of the show, we're going to talk all about it. You know what's funny about that, Len? Yeah. They had a piece in Forbes recently compares very favorably with gold. <laughs> well, that's awesome. But, but here's what I just, I wanted to bring that up because I just heard this week that hemp, only recently did they make hemp legal for uh, farming again. And I heard you get $30,000 profit per acre, if you can believe that. That's huge. Holy cow. So Len's, Can you believe that? Led's thinking about but coming out of the, out of the bunker. And he quit his job. There and he's into <laughs> I'm farming. I think I might be able to pull that off. Yes. I could plant 10 acres, and if only one acre succeeds, you know, if I get one acre's worth, heck, man, that's worth it. You know those you know those jokes about eating up the profits? What about <laughs> <That's exactly laughs> that. like, or smoking up the profits? There's, there's, there's nine fields that Len cultivates for personal use. Yeah. And like and jewelry and necklaces. Th- that and that the other the other uh he sells that voice you hear across from me, across the card table. It's Mister OG. I'm imagining Lens Bunker like it's like a big, like steel door, you know, that closes really slowly in the movies, and you've got to you got to run to the bunker before it closes, and then find it, it, you can like dive in, and it goes, and it just echoes, is that how it's like? You said it had multiple locks. That's what I was thinking. Just watch it. Get smart. If you've ever seen the beginning of Get Smart. That's kind of how you get in. It's about that. Okay, got it. You know the way it works. And wondering what the hell we're talking about. (laughs) Also also wondering why she's here on my dad's shortwave all the way from Florida. We've been threatening to get her on the show for, I think, like seven years. It's our good friend, Jerry Detweiler. How are you? 
Hi, guys. I'm well. And speaking of farming, I think the future is in cricket farming. So that's where it's at. So forget the hemp, forget all that. You just need crickets. Cricket flower. Cricket flower. That's it. Environmentally friendly, low cost protein. They're, that's they're, where my money's going. They're a little crunchy, but. <laughs> <laughs> there are some people who review this show who think we get lots of crickets during <laughs> some of our really bad jokes. But Jerry, tell everybody a little bit about you, the three people that don't know about you and know about NAV, the company you're with. Yeah, so I've been in credit forever and ever, and I, uh, about four years ago, joined NAV after writing about them, interviewing the CEO for my latest book, Finance Your Own Business. I love what they were doing. It's basically the simplest way to describe it is like credit karma for small business. And so I get to take all that credit knowledge and help small business owners hopefully uh, be successful. Well, I'm glad you decided to return to your roots today, though, and talk to individuals even about credit. So thanks for doing that. Well, small business owners are consumers too, right? Well, that's true. And a lot of times, very seriously, a lot of times, as you know, one of the problems with small businesses is everybody wants to tie up your personal credit when it comes to your small business. Yeah, exactly. And so then it's all mingled and it gets pretty ugly pretty fast. So we're trying to help them avoid that. Yeah. You know what else we're trying to not have be ugly here, Jerry? Hmm. It's it's our newsletter, The Stacker. Even though I have I have struggled with the software to make that baby go out, we've managed to make it go out almost every single week this year to sign up for what we said was, uh, OG, 52 weeks of lessons. 52 probably, days in a row. 50, yes, uh, probably not going to be that, but we're going to stay close. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Stacker. And we're headed to the East Coast. And you'll find out about that first on the Stacker. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Stacker to sign up. Oh, and that's not all. Thanks also to Ting for supporting Stacky Benjamins. With Ting, you pay a fair price for the talk, text, and data you actually use each month. The phone you already own, that probably works with Ting. Get $25 off your phone bill, 25 bucks off your phone bill, just for listening to us. How about that? At sb.ting.com. That's sb.ting.com. We've got a great show today. We've got Jerry Detweiler here. That's one reason it's great. We're going to talk about debt, too, and help you get out of debt and maybe help your credit. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. Our headline today comes to us from The Motley Fool. This is written by Maury Backman. Here's what the average American owes in credit card debt. Maury writes, there are plenty of good reasons to use credit cards. Not only do they offer a degree of purchase protection, but you'll generally get to accrue rewards for buying the things you already need. Still, there's a danger in using credit cards, and it's the ease at which you can overspend and wind up in debt. Such is the plight of the countless Americans who owe a collective $1 trillion in credit card debt. In fact, as of 2017, the average U.S. adult was on the hook for $6,814 in credit card debt, according to the Federal Reserve. If you're in a similar boat, it's time to start tackling that balance before it really hurts you in the long run. And then it goes into the danger of too much credit card debt. But but let's just start with this open here, Len. Does that surprise you? $6,800 for the average American in credit card debt? Well... As surprising, I don't know, maybe not. Uh, it's it's so easy for people to use credit cards. It's, it's, it's If you're not paying attention and you're not disciplined, I can see how you can quickly rack that up. Now, being us in the personal finance blogging sphere and certified financial planners, that's probably not, that's not common for us. But yes, I can see it's so easy to use a credit card these days. That total could rack up so quickly, It's uh, it really isn't surprising. Does that number surprise you, Jerry, that so many people have that much credit card debt? No, not at all. Uh, <laughs> I've been, like I said, I've been doing this forever, and, and I was involved in the very first credit card snowball program that came out. And back in the day, you had to actually get a form from us, fill it out, send it in, and we would calculate a payoff plan for your debt. This is, okay, so I'm, I sound really ancient right now, but... Uh, but at that time, the typical number was $25,000 in credit card oh, debt. Wow. You know, here we are, how many years later? And, you know, a lot of people are still struggling. But I think the one thing that really frustrates me when I see averages like that is that no one feels like they're average. 
right? We all feel like our debt situation is unique and we're struggling and we could be, we could be in a very different place. You could be, one of the things that the Fed has said is that the amount of credit card debt for older Americans, for seniors is seriously rising. So if you think about that demographic, they're going to have a hard time going out and getting a gig or something, you know, producing extra income to pay off their credit card debt. If you've got caregivers who are at home taking care of an elderly parent or a disabled child or anything like that, they're going to have a hard time generating extra income. So the numbers, sometimes I just want to be careful not to get so trapped in the averages that we don't realize, hey, these are individuals who are trying to figure a way out. Yeah, no, gee, to Jerry's point, I mean, it matters when you have the credit card debt. Those seniors that she talks about, that can be super ugly when you're on a fixed income. Well, and I think it's also important to notice that they're talking about the average adult. And if you're in a two person family, that could easily be thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars. And now you're talking about kind of some real serious money. Not that sixty five hundred bucks isn't serious, but I looked at it from the perspective of somewhat encouraging. You know, six thousand dollars is a crap load of debt, but it's one year's worth of IRA contributions, or it's a third of a year of contributions to your 401k if you're contributing the maximum. So, you know, if you kind of have this feeling of, I'm never getting out of this, I'm kind of hanging out here, I'm in this six, eight, ten thousand dollar $10,000 range, stop thinking that it's so far down the field to fix and recognize that it might be just two years of buckling down to get it done. What do you think the reason it seems like Len, so many people have such easy credit. Do you think it's the fact that we're all on debit cards now? Like the people paying cash, you never see anybody pay cash. And now that we're all used to using plastic, why not use somebody else's money instead of my own? It's easy. as I mean, You just don't see it. You know, when you have the dollars in your wallet, it's so much easier to feel the pain of spending that money. The plastic, it's you stick the card through the machine, you pull it out and you're done. And the next you don't think about it again until you get that statement. So it's just it's too easy, Joe. And I think that's that's part of the problem. Let me go back real quick to this average thing. I just thought of something else. You know, that's also based on that includes all of us who have zero carries pay mm, off our pay, yeah. our balance. Every all of month. you that have zero. You mean. <laughs> well, what, however, that is, OG. <laughs> but I'm sure that's a relatively large number as well. So that really makes that six thousand eight hundred dollar figure lower than it probably is right. for a lot of people. Uh, uh, Jerry, when it comes to credit cards, have you found the number of credit cards in our wallet has gone up? What they're finding at the Fed is that the number of inquiries is uh, pretty much the lowest in history, which oh. means people are not applying for as many new cards and there are more account closings than before. Oh. So those numbers are shrinking. But you did mention something, Joe, about how easy it was to get. And, and the average FICO score right now is also hitting records. So if you have a credit card in your wallet, there's a good chance your issuer is saying, here, here's some more credit. We'll, we like to extend your credit limit. So that makes it easier also to get into debt because, hey, if you're only using 6000 out of 25000 that doesn't feel the same as using 6000 out of 8000 <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, I keep reading all these reports that we're more debt laden than ever before, though, Jerry. And so I'm wondering where the – I mean – are we gaming the system with higher FICO scores? Do we know better because of credit experts, how, how the game works? I mean, why are credit scores higher? Well, they're higher because people are paying their bills on time. I think a lot of people, they recovered from the 2008 downturn and they were sort of scared straight for a while on their debt, right? Yeah, and yeah. now I think it's, it's far enough behind that enough people are not feeling the pain of that time. And they're feeling more optimistic about the economy. And so that's when you start getting a little bit more liberal with your credit card spending. And that's just, uh, we saw that before and we'll see it again. As confidence increases, people use their credit cards. What's the biggest factor when it comes to somebody's credit score? What, what can most impact somebody's credit score? Well, payment history is number one. But number two, the one you have a lot of control over is your credit card debt. So the one that I see the fastest movement for consumers is when they get closer to their balances on their credit cards. So you look at the balance reported by the issuer compared to the limit, that's your debt usage or utilization. And as you start to creep up on that number, your credit scores fluctuate. And I have, I have a colleague at NAV who's been tracking his carefully. He's young, so he has a shorter credit history. Everything's paid on time, but he's noticed swings of 40 points in a month 
depending on his debt usage ratio wow. because it has such an impact. Yeah, I found even lately because of some of the, you know, getting our house ready to sell and then uh, playing the credit card reward game. So we would stack a bunch of stuff on our on our credit card. We pay it off right away, but I'd see even way bigger. But that's because I'm probably dealing with some bigger, bigger numbers. But And, and it's I have a longer credit history. So maybe that's the, the would that be the reason why it would go up and down more? If you have a more extensive credit history, you should be able to buffer it more, but you must be just having some nice high balances. <laughs> just, just, he's just ringing the bell is what's happening. Joe's like 10 grand. Watch this. In, in 30 years, you, you, you know, you can game the system, right? So it, it all has to do, you know, Jerry hit it with the credit utilization ratio. So if you can make that as low as possible, you can game the system by getting additional credit cards. You can call your your credit card company and ask for your debt, your credit limit to be raised. Doing that will automatically raise your score a bit. And if you close your existing cards, it works the opposite way. So I know a lot of people are thinking they're doing the right thing by canceling their accounts, but that will actually lower your credit score. But isn't that a game of know yourself You know, I'm thinking that if I have somebody that's just horrible with credit cards, like even though I know that, even though I know that raising my credit limit will make my credit score better because less utilization and having having keeping credit cards open will also help my credit score. If I know that I'm horrible with those things, isn't it still better to just close it and forget about that game? Of course. Yes, of course. Yeah. Although but, Joe, I have to tell you, a lot of people ask me they they think that having too much credit is a bad thing. So they say, well, I have so many credit cards or I have so much credit available. It must be hurting my credit score. And FICO does not care. Yeah. They don't mind. I have a friend, the, one of the original credit card servers, 83 open credit card accounts and a credit score in the 800s. So it's, that's not the issue. The issue is those balances compared to the limit. Do you know what I worry about, about 83 open credit cards it has nothing to do with anything except annual fees. Like I started thinking about how many of those have annual fees and what's right. the number. I remember talking to one guy offline who, uh, this is about a year and a half ago at a FinCon, at a, at a conference that all of us have gone to before. And he had a remarkable number of credit cards. And I said, what's your annual fee? And he couldn't tell me. He was all excited about the reward point game. But yet he can be paying a huge amount in fees. How's the credit game changing, Jerry? I mean, you know, you, you were talking about you must seem agent. You're with Len and I, who always talk about being the old guys on the podcast. But over the past, <laughs> over the past 20 years, how has it changed? It hasn't changed that much, except for a a couple of things. One is that we have the Credit Card Act, right? The federal law that doesn't allow them to raise your credit card rate anytime for any reason on consumer cards. On business cards, those are exempt from that law. So you still could miss a payment on a business credit card and your interest rate could go to 28% overnight. So that's still something. Uh, The other thing we've seen lately is there's just so much heavy competition for the ultra high end of the rewards that it's kind of like, where are they going to go from here? You know, where are the issuers going to go to try to siphon off those high spending reward junkie consumers like some of us who are talking right now? I don't know. Um, It's extremely competitive, but as long as it lasts, I don't know how long it'll last, but as long as it lasts, there's some really good deals to be had. OG just had Citibank put a circus in his front yard. <laughs> yeah, <No. right. laughs> they keep they keep those membership board points coming. <laughs> I am game, baby. I'll do anything. That's fantastic. But but who should seriously at this point in the game be the person who pays all cash? You know, we've got Dave Ramsey talking about paying cash for everything. Who's the person that we should be talking to about uh screw the whole credit game. I just need to pay cash. OG. You know, I think it's a good exercise to do no matter where you are in your life every so often. And you can kind of determine what that is. Len was talking about the value of money and you kind of lose that when you don't have it in your wallet. I had a hundred dollar bill in my wallet for the last probably six weeks and I had to break it to pay for parking at this thing that I went to this past weekend. And the guy looked at me like, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, it actually worked out in my benefit because I was at my son's baseball game and they wanted to charge five bucks. And all I had was this hundred dollar bill. And the gal says, well, I can't break that. And I said, well, I guess I'll just stand here and watch from here. Then she goes, no, just go ahead. Oh, you look know, at you. 
Now, I did send a check with a note to the athletic department of the school. But my point is, is that you lose the value of that when you're not feeling it. So I really think that it's a good exercise to do maybe once a year, do a month cash diet and see what it feels like to actually go to the bank and get a pile of money and then go to the grocery store and peel off a couple hundred bucks for groceries and go out to dinner and leave a, you know, leave a stack full of money in the envelope thing. You're like, holy crap, this is a lot of stuff. It kind of recenters you a little bit. I like to do it. It's fun. Len, do you guys the uh, and the honeybee use cash? Yeah, we're a mixture. Uh, we do a little of both. So, uh, but mostly credit, Joe, because the rewards are just so yeah. <laughs> they're so good. I mean, it, it's like I feel like I'm throwing. It's not money, but I guess it, it is money in a way. We're, we're, we're throwing stuff away by not uh, using that card. But yes, we do use we do use cash. Jerry, do you use cash or are you a credit expert who plays the reward point game? I'm so pathetic about cash and I, you know, I travel and I'm like, where's my $2 to tip the <laughs> shuttle driver. I hate that. I wish I could Venmo them all. I feel so guilty. Um, yeah. So I only really carry cash for things like tips where I need cash. And that's so weird. I was in a hotel recently and I wanted to leave money for the housekeeper. Right. Right. I go downstairs. I said, I don't have any cash. Is there any way I can get some cash? She's like, well, there's a gas station down the road. This was at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> so, oh. so my tip is carry a little cash. Uh, my husband <laughs> uses a debit card, which drives me batty because I know he's missing out on his rewards. I love my rewards credit cards. And what I, w- I will give a tip here, business owners, if you use a debit card, your debit card is not protected under federal law. If it's a business debit card, there's no federal law that requires them to make you whole if the card is lost or stolen. So oh. I was in a workshop. This business owner said, yeah, I was in the bank lobby with the app open on my account, watching the money drain out of my business bank account. So it was the freakiest thing ever. So there's my tip. Wow. It's a business credit card instead of a business debit card. Let's go back to people, though, uh, individuals, not businesses, Jerry. I'll ask you the same question. Who shouldn't? use credit cards actively what portion of of the audience of our audience shouldn't use credit cards i love og's advice to go on a cash diet sometimes and there are some people who just don't feel comfortable with credit cards Uh, you know i still like credit cards for the protection for the safety of them but i understand you can get in over your head and it's just not for everybody there is that option out there. I don't know. Can I can I say it? The yeah. the option that lets you set up your credit card like a debit card, debitize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's kind well, of a cool option. They, they actually clothes? they actually just got sold. They did. Yeah. They yeah. did. They okay. just got sold. And well, and we're going to have Thomas Smythe on. I'm glad you brought that up. We're going to have Thomas Smythe on, who's with the company that purchased them, Trim, to talk about what's the future of debitize. So I'm glad you brought that up. But yeah, we need stuff like that. Okay, so that's an option to turn it your credit card into it. I guess if they're still doing it, I don't know. But. I'm looking forward to that debitized 2.0, we'll call it until we hear otherwise conversation. On the tip front, go to your bank, ask them for $2 bills. They I will give that. you $2 bills. They I always have it. some, they might not have a whole stack of like 50, but, but you can get a hundred dollars and $2 bills, keep some in your glove box, keep some in your wallet. And they're, they're kind of unique in terms of a tip because they're kind of the right amount for just about a lot of things like bags and hotels and, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then I can say, okay, I'm not spending this. Unless this is it's my tip, tip money, right? Yeah, it's, it's tip. my tip money. I love it. I, $2 that's bill. it. I, I do it, that's, OG. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Len, your mom would have come up with that one had she been on the show. Yeah, yeah she, your you know mom. What? She would have. She. Yep, you're absolutely right, Joe. Again, <laughs> she should have been here, not me. Let's let's stick with you, man. Uh, Len, what's the takeaway from this uh, credit discussion? Oh, well, you know, I guess I'm biased on this credit. You know, be very careful with credit. It's it's a double edged sword. If you know how to be disciplined with it, you can collect great rewards. If not, you might want to stay away from it and stick to cash. Oh, gee. Oh, I would just add to that that the moment you feel out of control, you have to stop because it's so easy to get out of control by a factor of 10. And and everybody who has gone through this always says the same thing. I knew I was in trouble, but dot, 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 just tear the bandaid off. If you see, see things uh, getting out of hand, stop. Jerry, and as our special guest, you've got the last word. And your credit card statement, there will be a number that tells you how to pay, how much you have to pay to pay that credit card off in three years or less. 
If you can't afford to make that monthly payment each month for three years and you know you're going to charge more, you need to get some help. Upstairs talking to mom right now from Acre Trader. It's Carter Malloy. You know, Len, I might not ask him about growing hemp. I'm, I might not. Why not? You got it. You got to do it just for me. So take some. You know, I'll I'll be taking notes. But I mean, this is. Uh, I'm excited by this hemp thing. Well, I'm excited about this idea of land because you know you like gold because you can hold it in your hand. You know, they're yep. as a lot of people say, they're not making more land. That's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, it, it, hey, it's a tangible item that has the potential. Unlike gold, it does throw off, it can throw off a lot of income for you. So, uh, you know, that ha it has that advantage. Now, of course, if you're trying to escape the country, uh, you can't take your farmland with you and, and uh, for a little extra cash. That's what the gold's good for. But, uh, yeah, yeah, for the farmland, heck, man, that's a, that's a sweet deal. I might, uh, I might put a little bit on top of my bunker maybe oh. I'll look and turn that into farmland well you might want to listen to carter and i talk first beforehand and then obviously get, do some research well len would do some research len would do tons of research uh, before he does anything but i started hearing about acre trader about six months ago and i was interested obviously because of our friday fintech segment and this idea of real estate that's not commercial real estate residential real estate as a guy who is uh, originally a redneck from West Michigan, I thought, farmland? Absolutely. That's in my backyard. I know exactly w what they're talking about here. So let's find out. Carter Malloy. Yeah, let's. Coming down to the basement. And here coming down the stairs is our new friend from Acre Trader. But more importantly, from Northwest Arkansas, my friend Carter Malloy. How are you, man? Hey, wonderful. Thanks for having me in the basement. Well, I'm so happy that you're here. How did you guys decide that buying farmland was the type of investing that you personally wanted to do? Sure. So I spent the previous dozen or so years of my career in, in the investment industry. Uh, most recently, the last five years uh, before Acre Trader, I was a, a partner at a, a billion dollar equity hedge fund. But basically, I, I've spent my time through most of my career looking for good long term investments. Uh, with the fund, I was, I was living out in San Francisco at the time. My, my neighbor was a successful technology entrepreneur, and uh, he was asking me, he knew I was from Arkansas, and was asking me how to invest in farmland. You know, he, he wanted to put some money there. He had read something about, about it having been such a good historical asset class and didn't know how to. And on my end, I had uh, grown up on a farming family. My, my dad and I had been successfully buying and selling farmland in recent years there. And so uh, after he asked me, I started doing some research into looking at the asset as a whole as opposed to just my my personal on the ground experience with it. And as I, as I started digging deeper into the asset, I discovered that <laughs> despite my dad and I thinking we were smart, astute investors and, and buyers and sellers of farmland, that actually most people investing in farmland, including the farmers, uh, had actually seen like really great historical returns. Mm -hmm. And so now today where we are looking at the overall asset class, there's something like $30 billion of, of private equity money invested in it. And then there's really smart people out there like, like Bill Gates that have identified and, and are investing against this trend. But despite there being like trillions of dollars of farmland in the United States, there's no real attractive way for, for most people to invest in it. That so, was actually my next question because OG and I had this debate on a recent show, Carter, which is if something's a great investment class, but most individuals aren't doing it, like what's holding them back? And clearly with farmland, there's got to be something holding them back. Yeah, it's just access. You know, I think for funds, if you want to go invest in a farmland fund, a private equity fund, you know, it's typically a million dollar minimum and a a 10 year lock on your, your money. Most people that you and I have ever met, uh, that's a non-starter. Um, you know, even people that have that type of money, uh, it's a non-starter. So yeah, I think that's exactly was when the light bulb sort of went off for, for me and for, for our team is, you know, we, we stepped back and said, wow, here's this, this assets returning 12% historically with far lower volatility than most other, uh, similar assets out there. We've actually got some great information on our site on the four investors section of our website at acretrader.com. It, it's really surprising when you when you step back and, and look at this asset. It's been performing so well over such a long time period uh, in a very stable manner. And there's a ton of it out there. But, but there's just no one really bringing it to market to the masses. So, so ultimately, I, I teamed up with, with some lawyers, some farm managers, some, some technologists, and we, we built a business plan that would turn into AcreTrader. So fast forward to today, uh, we're now live. The site's up and, and launched, and we're working on millions of dollars of deals 
Uh, we've got an online portal where investors can go on there and sign up and start investing in farmland in under five minutes and with as little as a thousand dollars. I want to get to how that works in just a second, but before we do that, uh, there was a piece that mentioned you guys recently in uh, Forbes and talking about where this asset class fits. And you do a good job of talking about how this may be a great gold substitute. Like if you've got precious metals in your portfolio, how, I don't know, is it the risk profile? Is it the volatility profile? Tell me about farmland versus precious metals. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So that's part of the reason we're so excited about this asset class is I think, you know, you can go stack it up against individual other assets and it, and it really outperforms them. But I think the thing that probably resonates the most easily is looking at it against gold. You know, there's $8 trillion of gold in the world and, or a lot of people have it in their portfolios as, as an inflation hedge and just something that's non-correlated. And, and that's why we wrote the article in Forbes is because I think when you step back, you go, why would you own gold when farmland gives you gives you a lot of the same portfolio protection characteristics, but does it in a, in a much better fashion uh, with far better historical investment performance. And, and oh, by the way, it pays you a dividend, right? The, the farmer pays you rent. So yeah, I think that's exactly it. You guys don't even correlate differently against, you know, stocks and bonds and that type of thing, but you have not a lot of correlation with uh, rental real estate, residential real estate, or with commercial real estate is my understanding. Yeah, it's sort of its own beast. And What's fascinating is, is there's not big swings in, in the price of it either, right? So like against the S&P, the, the correlation is almost, is literally almost zero. There's no positive or negative correlation. With inflation, there is some correlation. It actually correlates better than gold, right? So it actually outperforms gold just a little bit uh, when, when looking at a, at a pure inflation hedge. Uh, but, but yeah, you're, you're right. It's, it's just its own, it's its own unique asset. Um, and you make money two ways. Right. One, the, the farmland appreciates uh, annually uh, over time. And, and two, the farmer pays you rent. And so that, that's something we, we have to clarify a lot. So I think there's a misunderstanding. We're not farmers uh, and we're not asking the investors to be farmers. Right? You go out and you hold the farmland and the farmer pays you cash rent once a year. Uh, that's typically paid before they even plant. So you get a cash rent one check per year in March. Uh, and we, we pay out you know an annual dividend at Acre Trader. So you know, unlike in commercial real estate or residential real estate, which is probably the closest proxy. But over there, you're chasing monthly payments, vacancies, you got problems all the time, things break. Uh, but with farmland, your, your occupancy rates tend to be close to 100% and your default rates tend to be close to zero. Well, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about this myself before you and I talked. I'm thinking that, you know, farming can be so volatile. You just want to make sure the farmer doesn't go out of business. <laughs> As long as the farmer right. doesn't go out of business and keeps paying the rent, you're good. You're not on this swing of, you know, corn prices or livestock prices or whatever it might be. You, you don't have to pay much attention to any of that. It's more about, are they going to pay the rent bill? That's correct. The farmer bears the risk. Now, what's really fascinating is the government backstops the farmers, right? So, so unlike in a commercial, uh, you know, a residential real estate building, you know, where, where you have all kinds of defaults and, and volatility with the tenants, uh, or, or bankruptcies. Typically, the, the farmers have insurance on their crops and they're, they're backstopped by the government. Let's uh, dig into how it works. And you said a minimum investment is $1,000. Uh, you, you have to be an accredited investor at this point? At this point, we, we are working a couple of products uh, that we'll have live this year uh, or anticipate having live this year that will allow in non-accredited investors as well. So we allow, still allow non-accredited investors to come on site, create an account and, and begin the educational process, which we, we've tried to simplify and and, you know, put as straightforward as possible. Got you. And then you take each of these properties, and if you go to Acre Trader, you can look at the properties. I'm looking at properties right now in, is it called, it's so funny, Kankakee? You got it. <laughs> I am. Every time I drive through there, by the way, south of Chicago, every time I drive through there, I'm like, I, I'm not sure I got that. In Monroe, Arkansas, <laughs> close to where you live and not far from where I used to live, and in uh, Tunica, uh, Mississippi. So you've got three up here now. You show a few different things. You show it's called the AT Relative Risk Profile. What's that? Sure. On that, what we want to show is, is relative risk to other farmland. So you can see in, in the investment performance on the four investors piece of the website, you can see that the relative risk to other asset classes, that being real estate, the S&P, REITs, things like that, the relative risk tends to be lower. Yeah. Uh, but we built that risk score so that you can understand it's always risk versus reward, right? So, yeah. so the investors can go on there and understand like the, the Kankakee farm has a wind turbine on it. And so we, even though it's a 30 year lease with two 10 year renewals on it, uh, we consider that to be non-core farming. And so it adds a little bit to the risk profile. If the farm were to have debt on it, 
then that would increase the risk profile as well. Uh, though, though typically, almost always actually, we, we do not have any debt on the farm. And, and by the way, I want to return to that. When I said farmland historically returned 12%, yeah. it did that without debt. So this is, gotcha. this is a typically a non-levered investment asset, which is pretty fascinating to consider you know, versus other forms of real estate where you've got 70, 80% of the, the value is, is debt to the bank. Well, and I see too that even though that's historically been true, you don't set that out as an expectation either. But, I mean, I've seen, I've seen some other things that my long-term fans know, probably the company I'm talking about, <laughs> that, 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 that says that they're somehow creating these magical returns. So just because it does that, you're not setting that as an expectation. No, we, we like to set expectations low and you know, prefer to under-promise and over-deliver. I think that uh, there's a lot of risk out there, right? When you see a 15% IRR on something, you should be concerned. You should wonder, what is this and what are my risks? Uh, because leverage is, can, can be a really dangerous thing, especially leverage on speculative deals, right? Yeah. Let's talk about, so if I'm an investor, then I get an annual dividend payment, which is a return of, I, I'm guessing, my percentage of the rent. That's correct. And then let's talk about exit, because obviously being in the ground, it's the same thing as a rental property. If I, you know, need uh, want to take the family on vacation, I can't sell my bathroom only <laughs> to get out <laughs> to get out of it. I mean, to some degree, I'm locked up. How do I? How? What's the exit strategy for an investor to have a return of principal? Sure. So yeah, I, I want to step back a little bit just to discuss the, the structure of the deals. Yeah. Okay. Right. So as, as you're looking on the site there at Acre Trader, it's, it's really pretty simple. We take each parcel of farmland, we put it in a unique LLC. So we've got a, a farm operations manager on staff that's managed a couple hundred million dollars of farmland in his previous career. Uh, so understands dirt in a way that few humans do. And he comes I, through I literally. Bet, not to cut you off, Carter, but I bet he's fun at parties. <laughs> But that guy's actually great. We we went out last night, actually. <laughs> oh, did a, you really? He's a, he's a great friend and, a, and an awesome person. So, <laughs> um, but it's it's you know pretty straightforward. We we look through hundreds of of farms, and most of those are off market listings. We typically take an individual parcel. Uh, we'll put that in a unique LLC, and then investors come on our website and purchase shares of that LLC. So it's basically an IPO for an individual farm. It, it looks a lot like the the crowdfunding models you've seen out there. And importantly, you know, we handle all the aspects of administration, right? Working with farmers, working with managers, paperwork, payments, we, we take care of it all. The investors simply purchase shares and receive their dividend payments. It can be a totally passive investment for them, just like a stock. And then to your question in terms of exit, you know, beyond the, the annual dividends that you get is, you know, we are working on a secondary marketplace for people to sell their shares after an initial lockup period. But beyond that, each LLC also has a finite life five, 10, 20 years so that there is an end date to this where everyone is fully cashed out. Oh, each, and, and each, we do that. each one is specific then. That's correct. Gotcha. Um, and, and sort of depends on, you know, well, there's a lot of factors that go into that. So I don't, don't want to waste a ton of time on it, but the reasons we do that uh, is two primary reasons. One is we just want to make sure that that option is built in there. Should regulators ever change their mind about marketplaces or anything happen to acre trader. And, and two, it's just one of the many protections we build into each of the LLCs on behalf of the investors. We, we want to make sure that each of these LLCs have standard operating agreements protecting them and, and governing them ultimately uh, so that they act, each LLC effectively acts in the best interest of, of those investors inside of that LLC. Uh, and no one can come in and, and <laughs> you know, mess that up for them or speculate or, or do anything crazy without, uh, uh, yeah, so I guess that's what it comes down to is, is we just want to build protections in. We want to build something that's transparent. Everything you want to know about each of these pieces of farmland is on the website. Anything people want to know about us, about how we operate, um, the agreements, et cetera, we're, we're always happy to talk about that stuff. That's core to our mission is, is transparency and security and, and ultimately liquidity. That's pretty wide. It's just something buying farmland is something I hadn't seen before. Uh, you guys obviously aren't in this, Carter, just to spread the mission that farmland's a good investment. You want to make money. You guys, I assume, then just take a percentage of every deal. Do you operate kind of like a REIT where there's some money off the top? How, does, how do you guys get paid? Sure. We try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. So we charge the seller of the real estate on acquisitions and on dispositions. And then we charge an annual management fee. That annual management fee to take care of everything is 0.75%. So I, I think you'll find that management fee is much lower than most of the private equity and land investment funds out there. And we do that for a very clear reason. We want to keep all of our fees low. 
because uh, we know if we work in the best interest of the farmland sellers and the farmland investors out there, uh, we can we can just create a much larger business, right? Our our mission here is to democratize this asset class. We think we can build a really large company here, and so rather than try to scrape big fees off of everything we do, uh, you know, there's there's margin, and there's volume, and and we've decided that volume and scale is is what's important here. The site is acretrader.com, A C R E T R A D E R. Uh, That's right. And you have, as you mentioned before, you can take a look at the offerings, how it works, resources. It's all right there. Carter Malloy, thanks for hanging out with us and telling us a little bit about AcreTrader. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me in the basement. <laughs> hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And Joe's mom has informed me that the best way I can help her this Mother's Day is to get the f*** out of here. Well, if I were going to do that, I asked myself, how would I do it? I could walk, but Joe's mom seems to think that wouldn't get me the f*** out of here fast enough. I could take a bus, but she says I'm not great at long car rides. But then there's the train, you know, which is interesting because today happens to be the day the Transcontinental Railroad was finished. Before the railroad, to get from coast to coast, people had to either go all the way around Cape Horn, way down there, like in, I don't know, Antarctica or something, which took like six months. Or they could cut across Panama, but that was before the canal was built, which meant maybe getting yellow fever or some other disease, or by chancing it over land. Before the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, it cost a thousand bucks or more to get from coast to coast. Well, here's today's trivia question. What did the average cost drop to after the coast to coast railroads became popular? I'll be back with the answer in just a moment. All right, we explain the very complicated rules to this year game to Jerry backstage just before Doug uh, started reading. You got the very complicated rules, Jerry? I do. All right. Uh, OG, what is the score of this contest? Paula has three. Len has five. I have six. And everybody last week was over. Thanks to me. Everybody last week, strategery on OG's part. So because Paula is in last, that means, Jerry, you're playing on behalf of Paula. You get to decide, are you going to go first, in the middle, or last? Well, I'm going to channel my inner Paula, try to lower my voice here a little bit. I'll go second. She'll go in the middle. Awesome. Was I close? And it, No. <laughs> well, we don't know. <laughs> oh, no, I meant my voice. <laughs> oh, your voice. Absolutely. Yes. Paula, Paula plus one right there. Uh, Len? Jerry, your your payment will be in the mail shortly right after this. Thank you for going second. I'm going last. You're going last. Heck yeah, I'm going last. Which means OG for the like 12th time in a row gets to go first. So from $1,000 down to how much money? That was Man, I was hoping that this was the actual date of the Transcontinental Railroad because I was pretty sure I had this. And then you said, what, 1869? I was going to say 1865. So, dang it. I, I, I had that one in my wheelhouse. So it was a thousand bucks. And now it's some different number right after they have the golden stake, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, how low did it get? What did it get down? And that's to? the question I thought Joe was going to ask because I, I would have had that one nailed. The what year? color was the last spike? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a Len Penzo question right there. <laughs> so I think if you take like Moore's law, which suggests that computing power doubles, how far out in the distance? I mean, now you can get across the country in a train and you know for like eight cents or something. I'm not sure, but what's the time frame in which we're measuring this? I think it's just the lowest it got. Since 1869? Yes. Up to and including today? Yes. By train. Oh. Inflation adjusted? I know. Are we counting inflation? Or this, what's what's the lowest it got? A nominal amount. Well, you figure that, that, that after that, uh, I mean, for inflation, that means that the number today would be a lot higher. Except for the fact that things like air travel and train travel have gone down in cost. Sure. Um, so the real real cost of that has gone down. All right. So let me just think here. So prices are, uh, let's see, carry the one, divide by pi radius squared. I'm going to say $187.11. 
187 11. Jerry, what are you thinking? I'm guessing $427. Four hundred and twenty-seven dollars. Uh, thought behind that? None. It just came to my head. <laughs> it's the number that of that of manifested number itself. That's like, I love it. Throw Power the dart. of intention. Wayne Dyer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you got it. LP. What say you? I, I'm still. I, I, the question still. Good. So you're saying it was a thousand dollars that first trip, or, or before the transcontinental before railroad, transcontinental railroad. It yes. was a thousand bucks to go around Cape Horn or the. The Isthmus of Panama or what have you, right? It was a thousand bucks. Any way you went, it was going to be at the bottom a thousand bucks. A thousand bucks. And that was an 18, 16, dollars yep. whatever. So that's, that's got to be like, you know, $20,000 today. So what is the cheapest today to get across country, right? What, or Tesla ever? For what was free. the cheapest? What was the cheapest is ever? Is it What's, a Tesla train? What is the train what is what is by the, train? What is the cheapest? What is the cheap, by train today? What, what? Well, not today. Just what's the cheapest it's been? It it's may be, ever been. It, it, okay. it, it may be more. Okay. I got yeah. you. I by the way, you. this is according to the History Channel. Okay. Well, let's think about this. Today, let's say if I was to take a train across country, I think I could get across country today for probably a thousand bucks. I'm guessing in coach, that's going to be my guest in today's dollars. And I would say that's one. So the average salary or the average household income is 50 grand about in the United States. Uh, so that's one, that's 2% of in total household income uh, for annual. So let's see. Uh, what did that get me? That didn't get me anywhere, did it? No, that's, that got me into a cul-de-sac. I love, I, I love where this is going. <laughs> That's great. Like in a roundabout. $1, Joe, $1. God, that's... Len $1. goes with $1. It's going to happen. <laughs> Ooh, I'm going last. And guess what? I'm going to pick $1. Nice. Nice job. All right. We got $1, 187 11 and $427. We would tell you what the answer was. Well, we're going to tell you, but we're going to make you wait. So we'll be right back. I was just answering a letter from somebody in the basement Facebook group, by the way, if you want to join our Facebook group, it's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash basements, the easy way to get there, but their phone bill is over $200 a month. And uh, that's why we were excited to partner with Ting because you can always bring your current phone number over to Ting. It's not a prepaid cell phone company at the end of the month. You're just billed for the talk text and data levels that you reach. And of course, the less you use, the less you pay with Ting, you can use any phone you want, even the latest Galaxy Note 9 or iPhone XS. Uh, I think they want that pronounced 10S and still have an affordable phone bill. If you're often around Wi-Fi, you don't really need to pay for a set monthly data plan, do you? Because Wi-Fi is going to take care of that. So with Ting, you're only going to pay for your actual usage at the end of the month. Ting offers nationwide LTE coverage on both T-Mobile and Sprint, so the phone you already own will likely work with it. Just grab a SIM card from the Ting shop and bam, you're good to go. More phones on one Ting account, by the way, the less you pay per phone because usage gets shared across all of your devices. And there's no contract, so you can try it for a month with no strings attached. They offer award-winning customer support through phone, chat, email, social media, they're also, by the way, the only provider in the U.S. to offer technical support through Discord. You can check that out at ting.com forward slash Discord. It's funny, when we started partnering with Ting, I thought, new SIM card. I'm an old guy, right? So, so I'm thinking, how do I get this done? They send me the SIM card. It's super easy to put in your phone, and you're done. You're there. And all of a sudden, I now have a Ting phone. It was so easy to use. And by the way, the average Ting bill, just 23 bucks a month per phone. So I wrote back. I said, have you ever tried Ting? Because they can probably lower your bill a ton. It's pretty much a month of free service when you go to sb.ting.com because you're going to get $25 off, a full month off. Remember, start with SB, sb.ting.com. All right, uh, OG, $187. How you feeling? Uh, very melancholy. How's that? Jerry, when they started talking about going across the country for 1000 bucks, you were shaking your head no. I was trying to price a train, to uh, one of those train trips from Chicago to Portland, Oregon, and it was like $800 or something crazy. So I don't believe you can get it that cheap. Yeah. Len, 
One dollar. What do you think it really is? Three dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm thinking. You know what? Probably in World War One or something like that, you could probably get a ticket across country for twenty bucks or something. You know, that's a think about that. I mean, that's a gold double eagle was twenty dollars back then, which was, and I, I, I think you could have probably got across country with it for a gold, uh, well, one ounce of gold. We're about to find out, Doug. What's our answer? Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And good news, Joe's mom said I can hang around as long as I wash the Mother's Day dishes. Well, I mean, that ain't so bad. I mean, the lady's really a giver when you get right down to it. Now, here's how I'm a giver. Today's trivia question, which was this. Before the Transcontinental Railroad, which was completed on today's date in 1869, it cost 1,000 dineros to travel from coast to coast. After the railroad was established, just how low could this cost go? Because rail travel was popular and there were many more people riding, prices dropped dramatically. And within a short time, you could take the entire journey for 150 bucks. Of course, that was still a lot of money in 1869 dollars, but the land was finally open and people were traveling all over the place. As for me, I'm not traveling anywhere because I'm hanging out here for Joe's mom's celebratory Mother's Day dinner. I can't wait to wash those dishes. See ya! I'm shocked. I'm sorry, Paula. I'm sorry, Paula. How close was... What was the... 150? 150? Is that the number? 150. You won, dude. Yes. I I wasn't sure. Who said... I thought somebody said 100 and something. Uh, I said 187. Oh, okay. Great. Well, good, OG. Well, too bad for you. Looks like we're tied, buddy. So many of these. How many of these have I gotten (laughs) almost right, but just a little over? It's nothing. Like the McKinley one, this one. Oh, stop it. I missed the chips one by three. I was over by three episodes. I love all the complaining about how close you guys were. It's just so great. I submitted an amendment to the rules that is just simply closest. Uh, Retroactive right. to January 1st. Not happening. This has been way too fun to get this way. I very much like hearing you guys complain. Hey, instead like of hearing. Second the, second the motion. It's, yeah, we don't take this serious, Joe. Instead of hearing you complain, <laughs> let's take out the magnifying glass, shall we, and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to you courtesy of magnifymoney.com. When you go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you know what you find, Jerry? You find that those financial products you use every day, they're nowhere near the best in class. Over 92% of the products available online, all ranked at magnify money. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money for more. And today we're going to help Andrew with his money. Say hi, Andrew. Hi, Joe and OG. My question today is about how to think about balancing monthly housing costs and emergency funds. We're buying a new townhome and we'll list our condo for sale after we move out. The condo is paid for and the townhome is about four times as expensive. Thanks to years of saving and generous gifts from family, we have 20% down, closing costs, moving expenses, plus a 12-month emergency fund before the sale of the condo. I'm trying to decide if it would be better to put extra down on the mortgage, reducing the emergency fund to six months, or wait until the condo sells and pay extra towards principal. We are people that feel better with a paid-off home and will definitely look to pay off the new town home in less than 30 years. A lower monthly payment would potentially allow me to reduce my work by one or two days a month to support my wife who's not been working due to a two-year-old with special medical needs. We also have a $1,000 car purchased from family on its last legs. I don't have any other family connections for another car, so I've been watching for a deal on a Saturn SUV. Thanks for everything you guys are doing and helping me think about life and finances better. I love how he's very specific about a Saturn SUV. That, that's what all the cool kids drive, OG. $5,000 I was going to offer him a pretty good um, Volvo, but uh, apparently all he wants is Saturn. So. S- Saturn SUV for five right. grand. Yes. Uh, Jerry, let's start with you. What do you think? In my mind, this is pretty simple. I would encourage him to keep the emergency fund strong and not pay down the house at this time. We've got a one-income household with a child with special needs. And once you put that money in the house, if you really need it, it's very hard to get it out. I mean, obviously, if you're working and you've got income, you can qualify for a loan, but then you're paying interest on it. So I personally, and the other thing here is you're going from a paid off home 
to a mortgage, right? So right there, you need some adjustment to give yourself some time to get in the flow of that new budget, the new spending plan. I'd say hold on to the cash. Yeah, Len, you're nodding your head. Yes, I'm absolutely nodding my head. I'm a Jerry nailed it. It's like, you know, once you do, you make that extra payment for the house, your liquid, you're reducing your liquidity. And uh, I think he needs that liquidity. So I will say this also, Andrew's got a great voice for hypnosis. I, I found myself almost hypnotized from that. That's not nice. Andrew. So, if you need a career suggestion, let's snap, snap your fingers, Joe, please. Cause we'll <laughs> not snap me out of it. <laughs> Oh, gee, anything to add there? No, I'll echo the 12 month cash reserve staying put the house. Once it sells the existing one, the other thought was to use that extra money to pay down the house, or make a lump sum uh, principal payment. I also would punt on that as well. I might consider just setting up a separate investment account that is specifically designed to pay your house off sometime in the future, but only is at that time when you're ready to write the check for the whole amount. That way it gives you the opportunity as you, like Jerry said, get into the cash flow of the new house and the payment plans. And, you know, when it comes to a four times bigger house, it may not be four times bigger, four times more expensive, I guess it sounds like. They have more windows. They need more window treatments. They need more caulk in the summertime and better air conditioning. And, you know, there's more stuff. So you may find that you're not able to accelerate that payment, but this lump sum of whatever the paid for one on the back end may kind of knock knock off a a pile of years. In the meantime, if you are going to add extra to the principal, put it in the investment account that is your house pay down account. And then sometime in the near future, you know, maybe 15 or 17 years down the line, you'll have enough money in that account where you could actually choose to pay it off if you chose to at that time. Isn't that a little bit though of know yourself? Cause once again, if somebody, even though, I mean, to Jerry's point, putting it in a house, it's, you can't just rip off a bathroom if you and sell just a little piece of it. It's so difficult yeah. to get that money back out. But if you, but taking that money OG and putting it in a separate fund, if you're somebody that's just horrible with money and you're going to tap it all the time. Well, it doesn't sound like he, I agree with you in principle, It doesn't sound like Andrew is that type of person with an aggressive house payoff goal as it is and having already taken care of one already. So I suspect if he put his mind to it, that that money would be nice and safe and secure. And, you know, frankly, at the end of the day, if you kind of get into it a year and a half and you go, things are great, feeling pretty confident. And then you say, I want to take this 80 grand and pay it off or whatever, then just do it then. That's fine. But I would wait. Just there's too much stuff going on in your life right now to like lock up all this extra money, just drag it out a little while. Hey, what, oh gee, what, what did you say that you needed in the summertime? More what? <laughs> Don't you tip to cock the windows or have some <laughs> people come and cock the windows is what I meant to say. Sorry. Cock? Yeah. Don't you like oh in the God. springtime? Don't you <laughs> cock the windows? Not shut. I'm just the trim. Don't you go around the trim at your house and make sure that it's Cock is. I thought that was a cold winter thing, but um, we, well, we might cock our hurricane shutters in Florida. <laughs> yeah, come down to my house in July when it's 114, and you can I can tell you exactly what hasn't been cocked and what has. I, that's why my electric bill has been so high in Florida. I didn't know to cock. Thank you for the tip, OG. You guys can all kiss my ass. Uh, 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 Jerry, we normally don't have somebody who's an expert in the area of business and business credit. So I want to take kind of a tangent here. Instead of Andrew looking at, at a house, looking at a car, if he's a small business owner, does it matter what types of things you're financing, like in terms of the debt you're taking out? If he's a small business owner and he's looking at his consumer debt, he has to be just as conservative as he would be in this scenario. But if he were looking to invest in a business to grow his business, then he might make different decisions because with business debt, you can turn it into money, right? It depends on the opportunity. If it's a really good opportunity, you might be able to take some higher rate loans and turn that into even more money for your business. So the thinking can be a little bit different for a business owner than it is with a consumer, where a lot of times we're thinking about spending on things that might be gone by the time that debt is paid off. But business owner, like buying a building, let's let's say buying a building versus buying a house, like in Andrew's case, versus just meeting payroll. Is there a different interest rate you should expect for those two things? 
Yeah, probably. Because real estate, you're going to have a lower interest rate for the real estate based loan. And for something like a line of credit, you're going to end up paying a higher interest rate. And what the interest rate is depends on how much revenue your business has, what your business and personal credit scores are, and usually time in business is another factor. So once you've been in business in two years, then you have a better, usually can get a better interest rate than a brand new business. I know that OG and I have talked before about just business loans. It seems like they generally want a pint of blood and 6,000 pages of documentation about your business. What should we expect nowadays when it comes to getting a business loan? Again, it really depends on where you're going because there's a lot of online lenders now in the business space. There's one lender that there was a, a recent article that said their average loan takes seven minutes Holy cow. online to underwrite. Wow. Seven minutes. But the interest rate is you're going to pay the interest rate there. And in fact, about a third of those borrowers are applying between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. So that means they're probably looking for some quick cash and aren't comparing costs. But if you're going to go for a great, you know, low rate SBA loan, bank loan, something like that for your business, then yes, you will have to be prepared. You're going to ha- it's going to take you a little while to get it. Let's say it's all just caulk for the windows. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea how to respond to that. I don't don't know. Thanks for the question, Andrew. If you've got a, if you've got a question for the show, head to stackybenjamins.com. And at the top of the page, you can have us uh, help you magnify your money issue and uh, make it better. That's going to do it for today, guys. I think we'll have our guests go last. Uh, OG, what do you got coming up this mother's day weekend? Oh, I suppose I ought to um, do something for, several of the mothers in my life. I'll, I'll think of something before now. And when is it? That's good. You got 48 hours, pal. Less than 48 hours. Oh, it's Sunday? It is Sunday. Right. It got is it. Nice. I'll think of something. Nice job. Len, how about you? Joe, I have absolutely nothing going on at lenpenzo.com. So uh, you want to come over and watch me twiddle my thumbs over there? Just stop on by. Uh, there's always lots of interesting things to click on over here. Come yeah. on over. And, and Mother's Day weekend at the Penzo house? Every day. I've met the honeybee every day is Mother's Day at the Penzo house. If I know what's good for me. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Jerry, thanks a ton for hanging out with us. Thank you so much, guys. So, And so- I'm sorry, Paula. I'm sorry I let you down there. <laughs> Paula was doing a good enough job letting herself down. It wasn't like she was in first place. So, Jerry, don't worry about it. But, but, but tell us what's going on with you. What do you got coming up? On Mother's Day? Well, not just for Mother's Day, at your website, jerrydetwaller.com, any books coming, what's going on at NAV? I'm never going to write another book, but NAV is, <laughs> I, I pray I never write another book, but NAV is going great. It's keeping me busy. I get to travel all over the country and talk to small business owners and small business advisors. So I'm, I'm expecting it's going to be another great year and I, I, I love what I do. So I'm, I'm very lucky that way. Awesome. And people that want more, who is the person you're targeting, Jerry? Small business owners, new, established, any small business owner that wants to grow successfully and be financially healthy, we want to help them. Nav.com. And we'll have a link. As if NAV is not easy enough, we'll have a link in the show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Oh, hey, Joe, I got to go back. <laughs> you got another one? I, you know what? I'd like to tap tap your listeners. I am in need of somebody who uh, makes ends meet on $40,000 or less. And we'll stretch it out. We'll do 45,000 or less. If anybody out there uh, wants to share their story, uh, give me, contact me, len at lenpenzo.com. And uh, we'll see if we get you a a story feature. That's such a great series. And we'll have a link at stackybenjamins.com. All right, Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Absolutely, Joe. Happy to help out. Hey, first, take some advice from Jerry Detweiler. Thinking about adding a credit card to your wallet? Be careful. You're using other people's money, and without a solid budget, expense tracking mechanisms, and a strategy to pay them off each month, you could just be asking for trouble. Second, take some advice from Carter Malloy at Acre Trader. Though the idea of buying farmland might not be for you, the concept of adding dissimilar investments to your portfolio to control volatility is one that, you know, if you're worried about risk, is something you should explore. But the big lesson? Doing the dishes is one thing, but doing OG's dishes? Come on! That's a full-time job for somebody. 
Big thanks to Jerry Detweiler for joining us. You'll find her at nav.com. Thanks also to Carter Malloy from Acre Trader for joining us. Head on over to acretrader.com for more. Len Penzo appears courtesy of lenpenzo.com. This show was created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and there's a 73% chance that I played Chuck on Happy Days. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. And, of course, thank you to mothers everywhere. Remember, when your kid asks if they can start a podcast in your basement, the answer is always, heck yeah, that's exactly what I want my kids doing when they grow up. Jerry, welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show we don't talk about. What happens in the after show stays in the after show. You're familiar with the Fight Club rules. Okay. Yes. <laughs> She's like, no, but okay. Seems like a no. <laughs> but I thought since we have a credit expert on, we should talk about dumb debt. And I always think that's fun because, you know, people think that because we do this all day long, that every single move we make was fantastic. And maybe you've done something crazy with uh, debt. I know that I have. Anybody have a train wreck of a debt story? I have lots of stories. I've made lots of mistakes. Jerry, give you us a, hear, give us. You want to hear one. my most recent one? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so three years ago, I sold my twenty-two hundred square foot house and I moved into an RV. I did finance that RV, and I still have that RV, but I don't live in that RV, so. <laughs> I determined that it was a little too tiny. So I still, I do live in a tiny house now. I live in 500 square feet. Wow. Um, and that's paid for cash. But, you know, even though I bought this RV used and I, I, I don't know. Anyway, even though I bought it used, I still, you cannot believe how fast those things depreciate. It is like just <laughs> sucking money down a drain pipe. So I still have the RV and still think I'm going to do something with it. And I don't know. Who knows? I had three different clients when I was a financial planner who retired into an RV, started traveling around the country, and within five years had moved back into a house. <laughs> so why didn't I talk to you? <laughs> same, same thing. Just said, yeah, it was nice, but we're, we're done with that. There's something about, I don't know, is there something about putting down roots or, or what was it for you, Jerry, that made you stop with the RV life? Uh, well, we didn't last that long. I discovered it wasn't very conducive to my work. Okay. So RVs are very loud. So like doing a podcast oh. like this or something, I mean, when the AC was on, it would sound like it was an airplane hangar. Yeah. It was if awful. It had more caulk around it. Yeah, it yeah. would have been quieter. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'll caulk it and then I could live in it. Caulk it nice and, and, <laughs> and then my husband thought I was insane and we figured we'd be divorced if we didn't move into a regular house. So yeah. I had to do that. That's cool. There was that too. Uh, Len, you haven't done everything exactly perfect as an engineer. There must be a debt story somewhere. There is. It's, and I've, I think I've shared this before. It's it, My biggest one was one of my first things when I went into debt. And I bought a house at the top of the market. I oh, took you out did. a 
Hundred, huh? It's been a while since you've told this story, though. Okay, so it was uh, near. The, it was in Southern California. It was in uh, 1990. I, I couldn't have timed the top much better. Three months after I bought my house, it was 114 thousand dollars for like an 850 square foot World War II bungalow about 50 yards from train tracks, which were giant freights rolled by every 45 minutes and shook the house. I mean, it was a, I was so stupid, young and stupid. I bought the house because, hey, that's what you're supposed to do, right? You get a job, you buy a house. Anyways, bought the house three months from the top of the market. Market tanked, and I was upside down for seven years. I was stuck in that god-awful, nightmarish house that I should have never bought. And boy, I couldn't get out of that. Thank God it was an assumable loan. I don't think they even have those anymore. But somebody assumed the loan from me and got me out from under it. But oh my God, it was a nightmare. Wow. A nightmare. Just to get out from under the loan. Yep. Lucky, lucky you got that. Yep. Yeah. Do they have assumable loans anymore? Does, does anybody know? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think I, so. I haven't heard of them at all. You were, yeah. But it, did you say it was in California? Yeah. So what's yep. what do you think that house is worth now? Just out of curiosity. Uh, you know what? I check it every once in a while, just just for yeah. it's it's close to three hundred thousand dollars, right? Yeah. Now. So you know, you just didn't wait long enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, you've you've never had a debt story. I do it all presently, like just to try things out, see how it goes. I distinctly remember two things. Well, I've kind of three interrelated stories. So the first one was. The moment I turned 18, the moment I sent in for my first credit card, which was an American Express card, and I got it in the mail, and my mom looked at it and went, you can't have one of those. And I said, no, I'm 18, Mom. I can have an American Express card. She says, no, those are the ones you have to pay off every month. And I went, oh, yeah, I should throw that away. (laughs) (laughs) So I immediately talk about life lesson in finance, you know, <laughs> my mom was a gas that I would, would would have a credit card that you actually had to pay off. <laughs> so I promptly got a Clark gas station credit card, which uh, I don't even know if they're still in business anymore. Anyway, it was two hundred dollar limit, and uh, the gas station was right down the street from my high school. And I figured out that my buddies would give me cash if I let them, you know, use my card to fill up with gas. And you'd fill up their car, <laughs> which is awesome because then I always had piles of cash in my pocket. And then the card got shut down like three weeks into it because, you know, it maxed it out. And of course, I spent all the cash. So then when the bill came, like I didn't have any money. But I'm going to pay. What am I going to pay with? So I got out of that. Once I started working, I worked, start, started working at a bank and Citibank sent me a check in the mail that I could sign to cash oh, for $7,500, the low, low interest rate of whatever it was, 12% or something at the time. And, you know, I wanted to be really smart with that money. You know, I wanted to just do really smart things. So I put it right into savings bonds because that's how I was going to keep it nice and safe for when when the loan was due. (laughs) Oh, my God. So this is like when I was 18, between 18 and 19. And that was my, my early lesson in personal finance of boy. And it took me about six months to realize as I'm paying this loan, I'm going, wait a second. This is, I'm not keeping math, up this math. No work. <laughs> so then I cashed out of my savings bonds and of course got a three month interest oh. penalty, you know? So oh. three for the price of one. There you go. That is top that Joseph. That is painful. I, um, in the short time that, that I had, I've told the story elsewhere. My first card was an American Express card, and I was at a military college where you couldn't pay a bill. And yet, Jerry, back in those days, if you remember, they, have a job is what you meant to say. They would offer, well, I couldn't have a job. I couldn't pay the card. What did I say? You said you couldn't pay a bill. Well, I couldn't pay a bill because I didn't have a job. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm in a military college, couldn't do anything but march, but that didn't stop them from every college campus having a, you know, table there in Mark Clark Hall. And I signed up for the American Express card and I got it. And I think, isn't that Jerry, is that illegal now? It's limited. Yeah. They can't do it on campus and there's all kinds of restrictions, but yeah, back in the day you could get a hundred thousand dollars in credit, credit card, credit lines uh, while you were a student. By the end of August, your freshman year. (laughs) Exactly. You could just table to table. Uh, Yeah. I mean, yep. I had a friend, I had a friend, her name was Lisa, when I transferred to Michigan State, 
she was running a Ponzi scheme, a pyramid scheme. <laughs> well, not really a Ponzi scheme. I'll explain what it was, but it was a pyramid because An she was, MLM, it's a marketing. She, well, she, no, no, no. She was worried that marketing. she was worried that her dad was going to find out about her credit card debt. So she was opening up new credit cards to pay off the old credit card. And she was up to like her 12th credit card just to get a cash advance to pay the other credit card. And it was all going to come mm-hmm. crashing down. She was terrified that her dad was, was going to find out. It was a pyramid scheme on herself. Yeah, and it was a pyramid advances. scheme on herself. Oh my God. Myself, though, one of the dumb things I did in the three months before I lost my, my first credit card, when I called my mom to say, hey, mom, I took my friends out to lunch and I bought a sweater. How am I going to pay for this? Because I had no idea how I was going to pay the bill. I just got the credit card, thought it was cool, took everybody to lunch the first time we had, we had uh, leave on a Saturday. But one other thing I did during that month was... I got a Smith Corona word processor that was badass. This was before, you know, everybody had a computer. And so I get this word processor and instead of, instead of paying for it all at once, you got to put like three equal payments on your credit card. So my credit card had already been seized and was gone. And I get the, I get the notice that I've got the final payment being applied to the amount that I owe uh, to my American Express card for this Smith Corona word processor that I, unbelievable. Did those have those eraser tapes or how did that work? Oh, this was the thing. It had a little tiny screen and you could type like a hundred letters and take that part back before it would type. Mm-hmm. So okay. You, and then what? how would you get the words onto paper? Like, did Well, it- so then once you got to like a hundred words, you press a button and it would type that part out. Okay. And then you you could put another 100 words. I mean, this thing had a huge, huge okay. memory bank. Fancy. Yeah. yeah it was neat. It, <laughs> it might have been... at least 0.1 megs of RAM. <laughs> right, right, right. It came with a bunch of uh, mice and a wheel that you put inside it that would, that would spin the thing. It was really cool. 